right. Even though we're starting a brand new book for our Wednesday night Bible study, it's really just a continuation of 1 Kings, which is why I decided just to keep going through, because it makes sense. We've gotten all the way up to this point through 1 Kings. Why break um, everything that we've been focusing on week after week? And really, we're picking right up here. It's not even like a new book, because it starts off verse number 1 in chapter 1, saying, Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. And what did we read about in the last chapter of 1 Kings? The death of Ahab, right? I mean, it was just, you know, that was where we're leaving off and we're picking right back up again. So um, we're picking up here. Moab rebels against Israel. You know, Ahab had, had reason to, uh, to make people afraid, even though he was an extremely wicked king. You know, he still was a mighty king and God still used him. You remember when, when uh, God used him to win that great victory and over Syria? And they were just like, he's like, well, who's going to lead the battle? He's like, you are. You know, and God still wanted to perform the victory of Israel over Syria. You know, he had his reasons for that. God's the one who's lifting up and getting victories and things like that. But in the world's eyes and everyone else's eyes, Ahab did it, right? God is supposed to be getting the glory. But to the heathen that don't even believe in the Lord, they're going to think, oh, Ahab's this mighty warrior. We, you know, what can we do? So Ahab dies, and then Moab decides, hey, we're going to rebel against Israel. And that's where we're, we're at here. We started off. And um, not that that's extremely pertinent to the rest of the things that are going to happen in the story, but um, there's starting to be some turmoil. And this, this has a tendency to happen. You'll notice it's happening when various kings die. There's a lot of things change, and then you start to get more enemies, and, and, and more conflicts will happen especially after the death of a, of a king. And Ahab was in power for a while too. But um, look at verse number two. The Bible says, And Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go, inquire of Baal-zebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. So Ahaziah is the son of Ahab. He has an accident. He, has an, he suffers an injury, falls down through a lattice. And I'm guessing it says because he was sick that he, maybe he uh, got an infection or something along those lines. And, and he's really seriously sick. So he sends off messengers and saying, hey, go on to Ekron and go inquire of Baal-zebub to see if I'm going to recover of this. So obviously, we have another wicked king here, a son of a wicked man, Ahab, not a believer in the Lord at all, but believes in some other God from some other land, some heathen land, just saying, hey, send unto them and, 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 and see what that God tells you. Now, one thing that you need to know is this Baal Zebub, whether it be Baal, Baal Beerith, Baal Zebub, they're all various gods that you'll find in the Old Testament. Baal being the, the, the most commonly referenced as far as false gods go. But that's also why you may notice the word Baalim. When you notice the word Baalim in the Bible, that, that I am just means it's plural for Baal. So like you, if you see um, seraphim, when it talks about like various angels, that I am is a, is a plural ending to, the, to many of those words. So you pay attention to that. We notice that. And when it says that they, they worship Baalim, it's just they worship these various Baal gods because people made up their own version or variety of Baal right. which Baal is just the devil anyways now in the New Testament Baal Zebub is referred to as Beelzebub right Baal Zebub Beelzebub it's the same God it's just you know a little bit different spe spelling from the Greek translation uh, Matthew 12 24 the Bible reads, you don't have to turn there, the Bible says, but when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. So that's their accusation against Jesus Christ. Of course, Jesus Christ was coming forth and, and casting out devils. And the Pharisees are saying, oh, he's casting them out through the power of Beelzebub. So Beelzebub, according to the Bible, was a pretty high, you know, the prince of the devils, right? He was this, this, this God that's being worshipped, but... Is a, is a really wicked God, right? It's, it's, he's considered the prince of the devils. It's really, all of them are basically Satan anyways, or Satan or any one of his devils that they're worshiping. But they're very popular. 
And you'll notice that throughout the Old Testament too, that the references to Baal, I mean, there's always a lot, seem to be a lot of Baal prophets. You know, that's who Elijah was fighting against, was the prophets of Baal. Just a few chapters ago, or a few weeks ago, when we were in, um, in 1 Kings chapter 20, I think it was, where he where he's, has that big confrontation with the 400, 400 prophets of Baal. And you'll see that that's where the, the children of Israel are continually whoring around with is these gods, is Baal worship uh, when they're not following the Lord. But Beelzebub, in you know, particularly, we see this here. And for the longest time, when I was into listening to rock and roll music, and I wasn't, you know, before I was even saved, and even after I was saved, this is something that I, I really love to do. And I'm not going to have a whole sermon tonight on why you shouldn't be listening to worldly music and rock and roll music. But I'll tell you what, don't just ignore the stuff either. Don't ignore how wicked the, the classic rock, the rock and roll, the rap, I don't care what genre you listen to today, the worldly music of the day is extremely wicked. And there's a song by Queen. You want to talk about a wicked band, Queen, whose lead singer, Fr Freddie Mercury, was a sodomite, a flaming homo, I mean, the name of the band itself, Queen. It's a bunch of dudes, and their name is Queen. And in one of their most famous songs, Bohemian Rhapsody, they have a line in that song that says, Beelzebub as a devil put aside for me. And you're going to tell me that, oh, there's nothing wrong with that music. Oh, they're just joking. Oh, they mean something else. He's talking about the prince of the devils having a devil put aside for him. Why? Because he's wicked as hell. Because he's a child of Belial, he's a child of Baal himself. Spreading forth his wickedness. And you find this stuff, and it's not by accident, it's not by coincidence, in, in all of his music where they're just saying blasphemous things, they're promoting wickedness, promoting drunkenness, promoting drugs, promoting fornication, promoting adultery, promoting everything that's wrong. Everything that's antichrist is coming out of this music. And you think, oh, but I just like the song. Shame on you if you're listening to this stuff. I'll tell you that right now. You ought not to. It's a disgrace. Beelzebub. Just a little bit of information here we see from the Bible. You see Beelzebub. We see that Ahaziah is going to inquire of Beelzebub. And you know what happens to him? Elijah's got a message for him. A message from God saying, why did you go, and this is what he says in the story, why did you go to seek unto another God? Is it not because there isn't a God in Israel? He said, you're going to some other country to some false god because you guys have forsaken the Lord. And for that reason is why he says, that's why you're not going to get off your bed. That's why you're going to die. For that very reason. They didn't, because he, because he went and inquired at Beelzebub. God killed a man for that. He said, you're not going to reco recover. You know what? If he would have gone to the Lord, I bet he would have recovered. But he didn't. He went to Beelzebub. And you want to go and listen to music that says, Beelzebub's got a, a devil set aside just for me. And think that's cool. And think, oh, it's no big deal. They're joking around. Yeah, right. Let's keep reading here, verse number three, because I, I got other, a lot of other things I want to get into. This is a side, a side mention. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, is it not because there is not a God in Israel that ye go to inquire of Baal Zebub, the God of Ekron? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord, thou shalt not, he says, now therefore, it means as a result of this, now therefore, thus saith the Lord, thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. And when the messengers turned back unto him, he said unto them, why are ye now turned back? And I love the power that God's word has and the power that's just behind us. They were sent to go do something else and Elijah, you know, to go to another country to, to seek another God. And Elijah just comes at him with the truth and just says, here's what the Lord said. Go and tell your master this. And they didn't just say, no, no, he wants us to go here to, to, to find out what this God says. They just turned back around and were like, okay, we'll do it. And that's just, that's the power of God's word right there. But, um, because then he asked him, he's like, why, why are you here? Like, wh I just sent you away. Like, you, you, like, there's no way you could be back so quick. What are you doing coming back? Verse number six, and they said unto him, 
There came a man up to meet us and said unto us, Go, turn again unto the king that sent you and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that thou sendest to inquire of Baal Zebub, the God of Ekron? Look at this. Therefore thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. That was the message they gave to him. Therefore, for that reason, you're not going to recover. You're going to die. Verse number seven. And he said unto them, What manner of man was he which came up to meet you and told you these words? So he's saying, Well, what, what was he like? Who was this guy that came up to meet you? Verse eight. And they answered him, He was an hairy man and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, It is Elijah the Tisho. As soon as he hears like this hairy guy, he's wearing a leather, he's like, That's Elijah. <laughs> That's Elijah the Tishbite causing problems again. Here he is coming out of the woodwork, just, just reaching against me. And um, you know, I love that description too. You see, Elijah was a man's man. Okay, now look, you don't have to have a whole bunch of hair to be considered a man. I mean, it says he's a hairy man. He probably had a big beard and he probably had you know, hairy arms and, and hairy back. You know, I think of... Uh, if you ever watched wrestling, I watched wrestling when I was a kid, professional wrestling. So I always think of like George the Animal Steel or something, you know, like you got a hairy back and, you know, like that was a hairy man, yeah. right? And I'm not promoting wrestling or whatever. It's just what comes to my mind when, uh, when I think of that. He, Elijah was this, he's a hairy man. He's girt with a girdle of leather. But what's interesting about this description and what's interesting just in general about the, um, about the men of God that you find throughout the Bible is how warped people's views are today of godly men and what a godly man should be, how, what a man of God should look like, what a man of God should sound like, what a man of God should, should carry themselves as. It's, you know, it, it, it's been so sissified today and men have gotten so you know, demasculized and, and, and taught that, no, you need to be like extremely sensitive and you need to lower your voice. You know, so my voice is getting a little too loud. I guess, for preaching because in 2017, as a man, you're supposed to, I'm supposed to just sit up in here and share with you, right? And we'll have some Barney time and, and share and care and, and you know, we'll, we'll talk about our feelings. But that's not, that's not what the men in the Bible are. You know, I mean, when you look at the, the great men in the Bible, we see Samuel. Samuel hewed up some, some kings that were pretty wicked because the king wouldn't do it. Saul so wouldn't do it. He's like, okay, bring him over here. I'll take care of this. And I'm not saying that every preacher is supposed to go off and kill people. I'm just saying this is, this is the type of men they were. They weren't afraid to do the dirty work. They weren't, they weren't backing down from doing what needed to be done. They'll say what needs to be said. They're going to stand up and be strong and be firm. And yeah, maybe they'll be a little hairy. Maybe he wasn't clean cut, clean shaven and looking exactly the way that you want him to be. But you know what else is interesting about this, specifically talking about Elijah and this description of Elijah? Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 3, because Elijah was prophesied to come again before the coming of Jesus Christ. And we see this exact description. Well, what, what, what manner of man was it? He was a hairy man and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. Matthew chapter 3, we're going to see a little bit about John the Baptist. Verse number 1, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair, look at this, and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. We read the stories of Elijah being out by the brook and he's being fed with meat by the ravens that were bringing him food. He's out in the wilderness. He's out doing his thing. We're going to see in a minute he's up here sitting on top of a hill. Leather girl, which is just a belt, right? He's got a nice leather, got a nice leather belt, right? Holding up his, holding up his pants. Holding up his work pants. Because we know he was a worker. And we see John the Baptist the same way. He's out in the wilderness preaching. And he's not preaching a soft message. He's saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. He's got on his camel's hair for his, for his clothing. And he's wearing a leather, leather girdle. And he's, got, uh, he's eating locusts and honey. 
Look at, turn if you would to Matthew 11, because we're going to see Jesus describe John the Baptist as well. And again, to give you a little indication of what the, what the man of God, and, and we'll see here the way that Jesus speaks of John the Baptist. And basically what he's doing in, in Matthew 11, he's asking the people, he's like, what did you expect to see? You went out to see John the Baptist. What were you thinking? What do you expect to see? And, and obviously he, he's bringing up the way that some people might think for that time, which I think is probably similar to what people might think this, in these days as well of how a man of God should act or, or should look like or should be. Look at verse number seven. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, what went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? Oh, what, someone that doesn't have a spine? Someone that doesn't have a backbone who's just blowing and being tossed about with every wind of doctrine where he's just checking the, the which way the wind's blowing so that I could say the, the right thing to so the people depending on the political climate and what's, what's uh, culturally acceptable? Is that what you went out to see? Some reed just shaking in the wind? What went he out in the wilderness to see? He says, but what went we for to see? Verse number eight, a man clothed in soft raiment. Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. He's saying, oh, you think he's delicate and he's just dressed in all this real nice, fancy outfits and stuff. That's not John the Baptist. He's, in, he's, not, he's not brought up in some king's house with a silver spoon in his mouth. Look at verse number nine. But what went he out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. He's saying, he, John the Baptist at this point is the greatest man to have walked the earth. I mean, outside of Jesus Christ himself, he's saying there is not a risen a greater than John the Baptist. And what was John the Baptist? He was dressed in camel's hair with a leather belt and eating locusts and wild honey. And you know what? It doesn't matter. He doesn't have to be all fancy, dressed up and, and wearing soft clothing to get people to listen to him or respect him. He's preaching the word of God with a backbone. That's what makes him great. He didn't care about the outward appearance as much as he cared about preaching God's word. And not being pushed around. And, and he preached God's word until it got him cast into prison. Because he was saying what was right. And he didn't care who he was saying it to or about. He just called it the way it is. Verse number 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent taketh it by, for take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. Elias is Elijah. It's the, 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 the New Testament way of saying Elijah. He's saying this is Elijah that was prophesied to come. It's interesting seeing the, the similarities between the way that Elijah was and the way that John the Baptist was because John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah because that's why Elijah was prophesied to come again. We had John the Baptist, same way, calling it out with a backbone preaching the word of God to whoever's going to listen to him. And with authority, too. Remember when the Pharisees came at his, you know, he's baptizing people. And then he's like, oh, generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And then he says, uh, he tells them, you bring forth fruits meat for repentance. Because they were wicked false prophets. And he's saying, you want to get baptized? You want, you know, because with all the other people, they're claiming the, their faith in Jesus Christ. And he's baptizing. He's saying, you know what? You guys are snakes. You're wolves. You really believe this? You know, show, you know, I'll, I'll baptize you. you. You bring forth fruits meet for repentance. That you actually changed your mind. That you actually are believing on Jesus Christ now. Because they were being crafty and subtle and trying to sneak in and, and, and infiltrate and trying to, to bring people back captive into bondage of the law that have made, been made free through Christ. And he knew it. He was aware of it and he was calling them out. He wasn't afraid to call them out. He wasn't afraid, he wasn't afraid of anything that we can see in the Bible. Now, obviously, everyone's got their own you know, personal things going on, but, but he stood up for the word of God. Even when it meant being cast into prison. Let's go back to uh, 2 Kings chapter 1.
So the messengers deliver their message to Ahaziah. And it's not a good message for Ahaziah. He asks him, well, what kind of man was he? He describes Elijah. And he's like, yep, that's Elijah. So then the king, here we're going to pick up in verse number nine. Then the king sent unto him a captain of 50 with his 50. And he went up to him. And behold, he sat on the top of a hill. And he spake unto him, thou man of God, the king had said, come down. So you got this captain of 50. It's like 50 soldiers. I mean, think about this. For one guy, for Elijah, he sends 50 people to go arrest him. And he says, hey, the king said, come down. You know, thou man of God, come down. Elijah answered, said to the captain of 50, if I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy 50. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his 50. This story is referred to, of course, it happens again. We see this here, verse number 11. Again, also he sent unto him another captain of 50 with his 50. And he answered and said unto him, O man of God, thus hath the king said, come down quickly. You know, some of them, they're just ordering him. Just, hey, get down here. The king wants to talk to you. Come down quickly. And Elijah answered and said unto them, if I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee in thy 50. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Now he knows the situation he's in. 50 soldiers show up to take Elijah to a wicked king that he's just prophesied against and told him he's going to die. Okay, so put yourself in his shoes for a minute. He's being threatened. He's got soldiers showing up and saying, hey, you get down here right now. The king wants to talk to you. He doesn't know what they plan on doing to him. But notice, he doesn't get physical with them. He doesn't try anything like that. He relies on God to protect him, and he calls out for him. He says, hey, okay, you call me a man of God. If I'm a man of God, then let's let fire come down from heaven. Now, was that wrong for him to do that? Was that a sin that to ask for, you know, to have fire, to call fire down and kill those men? If it were, I don't think God would have given him the power because Elijah wasn't the one that had the power to do that. It wasn't, of, it wasn't Elijah's own mystical, magical power that he's just calling fire down from heaven. The power came from God. It's the only way that, that any of this is going to happen. Elijah was a man of God, and he obviously heard him. Now, turn, keep your finger here, because we're going to come back to it, and turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 9. Because it's important to understand this story in the New Testament, because it brings up what we're reading here in 2 Kings chapter 1 about Elijah. And we see the spirit that Elijah had. And Elijah had a tough time. He lived in a time where it wasn't very many people following the Lord, but he stood up for, for what was right. He preached the word of the Lord. He had a lot of adversaries. And God protected him against all of them. All of them. Every single time. He had nothing to worry about. He had, God was on his side all the way through. And even in these situations where there's, he's surrounded, I mean, he's on top of a hill and you got 50, I mean, imagine being confronted by 50 soldiers. 50 military guys showing up to arrest you. You didn't do nothing to anybody. I mean, you're, you're minding your own business on top of a hill. And basically, Elijah's just like, God help me, you know, like, <laughs> I got all these soldiers here. Can you, you know, destroy them? And that's what happened. He called, you know, fire came down from heaven and, and boom, consumed him. So that's the situation Elijah was in. Look at Luke chapter 9, verse number 51. We see the disciples of Jesus bring up this story. Look at verse number 51. The Bible says, And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. So Jesus, he knows his time is coming to an end. He's saying, okay, we need to go to Jerusalem. Verse number 52. And sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. So he's in Samaria. He's, he's, he's going into some village to make ready. Now he's, he's planning to get to Jerusalem. So he's, he's on this, this, this journey and he needs to stop and spend the night at a, at a place. So he sends messengers, okay, get a place for us ready in uh, Samaria. Verse 53, and they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. So the reason why they don't, they don't let him stay there in Samaria is because, no, you're, you're headed to Jerusalem? Well, forget it. We don't want you to stay here then. 
Meaning, if he was going to stay there, or whatever, they probably would have been just fine with him being in Samaria, preaching to him, teaching him, whatever, or staying there. But they're like, oh, wait, you're going to Jerusalem? And, you know, there was conflict between the Samaritans and the Jews anyways of Jerusalem going on. And I'm not going to get into all of that. But basically, this is the situation. So they're saying, no, we don't, we're, you're not welcome here. You, we're not going to put you up for the night because you're headed to Jerusalem. Not exactly the same thing as having 50 soldiers come aggressively against you, right? right? They're just saying, no, we don't have any room for you. No room in the inn, right? And something Jesus has been used to all his life. But um, they just weren't being hospitable towards them. So then, verse 54, it says, And when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? Saying, oh, oh, they're not going to let us stay there? Well, what do you want us to do, Jesus? Do you want us to, should we just call fire down from heaven and destroy them? Verse 55, but he turned and rebuked them and said, ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. They said, we'll just go somewhere else. We say, what are you thinking? They needed a rebuke. What are you thinking killing people just because they won't receive you into their house? But that's not a reason to kill people. Now, what, what, what people don't understand about this, though, I think, is that they'll, they'll, they'll look at this and say, well, God's different in the New Testament, and that if Elijah were around in the New Testament, that that, that would have been wrong, or Elijah's of a wrong spirit or something, to have called down fire from heaven. Look, there was nothing wrong with Elijah's spirit because God listened to him. When their spirit was wrong in a completely different situation, that they weren't supposed to be going and just destroying people with, they got rebuked for it by God through Jesus Christ. If Elijah was wrong in calling down fire, he would have been rebuked for it too. God wouldn't have just cast fire down. But he was right. He was in the right spirit. So there is a proper time and place for, for these various types. You know, for you're being aggressive against the people coming against you, call God, God protect me. You know, these people need to be destroyed. Or wicked people be destroyed. As opposed to, oh, they're just not open to hearing. Okay, that's not cause for, for destruction. And these stories, unfortunately, they, they get spun around in the New Testament into making us think, and people take this and say, oh, see, you just have this poor spirit about everything. And calling out false prophets or doing, you know, doing things that need to be done. We need to get, understand everything in context. And, and one of the most important things is, first of all, besides the situation being different than what Elijah was facing, is that Jesus was on a specific mission when he was on this earth. There are a lot of, a lot of aspects. I'm going to be preaching on this on Sunday, but there's a lot of different things that we need to do. And I, and I touched on this last Sunday. I, I preached on, are you a soldier? There's various hats that we wear as Christians. There are times when you need to be very meek and humble. I mean, we always ought to be humble and meek, right? But there's also times where you need to, have a, to stand up and be strong and be firm and to, to call things out, to call sin out, to preach the word of God from the housetops, right? There's all these various th ways that we need to interact with people, hats that we have to wear, and being a soldier, whatever the case may be, we need to know the right time and place for every single um, situation when it's proper. Now, we see here, Jesus Christ came the first time as a servant. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. But you know what? He's coming again. And when he comes again, he's not going to be a servant. He's filling a different role. When he comes back again, he's setting up a, a kingdom. He's going to rule with a rod of iron. He had a different job to do the first time he came than the second time he comes. He's filling a different role. But what people want to do is they want to take these passages and twist them around to make them mean something that they don't. Right. So when they want to destroy people in the New Testament, Jesus said, that's not why I came here. Now, is Jesus going to destroy people? Yes, he is. When God's pouring out his wrath, when Jesus comes on a white horse, there's going to be a lot of people destroyed at the Battle of Armageddon. But that's not why he came the first time. That wasn't part of his mission. Turn, if you would, to um, John chapter 8. 
Most famous verse of the Bible, John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That was the purpose of Jesus Christ coming. He didn't come to condemn the world. He didn't come to bring judgment. He came to be a savior. He came to offer salvation and to seek and to save that which was lost. And this is what so many people get wrong about this other story. Now, it's very similar about the woman taken in adultery. See, so they want to take these statements of Jesus Christ, like we saw there about Elijah and saying, look, you don't know what spirit you're of, and rebuking them rightfully for what they were trying to do. But people will take that and turn it on its head to make, to, to make it mean something it doesn't. And this, John chapter 8, the, the, the woman taking adultery is a perfect example of this. Perfect example. That people turn to this story to try to tell you that, you know, Jesus is against the death penalty. They'll try to tell you that Jesus is against, you know, the, the, the Mosaic law, the Old Testament law, the laws of God. And tell you all kinds of different things. When it's not what is being taught here at all. What's being taught here coincides with the whole point that Jesus came in the first place. He didn't come to rule and to, and to enforce God's laws physically on this earth. He came to be a savior. And that even someone who commits adultery, a sin worthy of being put to death, can still receive salvation, can still be saved. But let's look at this. I mean, we're going to go over this a little bit, not too far in depth, because I don't want to stray too far away from the point that we're, that we're dealing with in 1 Kings. But it, it, it's all relevant. It's all related. We've got to be aware of, the, of what people are doing when they're trying to overthrow teachings that you find in other places of the Bible, in the Old Testament or wherever, with, uh, with some of these stories. So look at verse number 3 here in John chapter 8. The Bible says, And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. When they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? In verse 6 is critical to understanding this passage, by the way. Because they bring, they bring this, Jesus is minding his own business. These Pharisees come up and they're like, we caught this woman red-handed. She was in the act committing adultery, no doubt about it. What should we do with her? Because, you know, Moses said she deserves death. So why are you bringing them to Jesus then? Why are you bringing this woman to Jesus Christ if you already know what God's word says? Why? Verse 6 explains it. This they said, tempting him. They're testing him. Well, how are they tempting him? That they might have to accuse him. They want to make an accusation against Jesus because they hate him and they want to put him to death and they're trying to find a way to catch him in his words so that they could find something they could, they could pin against him to, to bring him down. In the situation that Jesus was in, in these days, under Roman rule, because the Jews did not have the authority to put people to death, even though they supposedly they believed in the law of Moses, right? They knew that this woman, according to the law of Moses, deserved the death penalty for committing adultery because that's what the Bible says. That's true. But under the Roman government that they were under, they weren't allowed to try people and put them to death. That's something that authority was not given to them. So if Jesus says, put her to death, he's going to be in trouble with the Roman government. Now they're going to say, aha, uh -huh, see? Because they're looking to catch him. They're looking to trick him. They're tempting him. Oh, look, Caesar, he's trying to usurp authority over you and what you've said they could do. And then if he says she doesn't deserve death, it's, hey, he doesn't believe the law of Moses. Look, he's coming and changing the law and doesn't believe that. And either way, it's one of those catch-22. Either way, whatever he answers, they're thinking, we got him. This is, this is a lose-lose situation, no matter how he answers it. So they think. It says, but Jesus stooped down with his finger rolling on the ground as though he heard them not. So he's just ignoring them. It's just like, whatever. Verse 7. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Did he say don't kill her? Did he say don't put her to death? No. Did he, did he, did 
Did he come and destroy the law of Moses? Jesus Christ himself said, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. He came, he says, he says one jot and one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. He said, I didn't come to destroy the law. That is not why he came. He came with a different purpose, a different mission. He's not undoing the law of Moses. And in his response, he didn't undo the law of Moses. Now, is he also teaching something else here as, in, as well by saying, hey, look, if you're without sin, go ahead and cast it for a stone. Of course he is. He's pointing out their hypocrisies. Because they didn't care about upholding the law of Moses. If they did, they would have been carrying out the law of Moses with everything else. They didn't care about it. Verse 8 says, And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest and even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. He got his point across. And it's a good point that he's making to him, by the way. But it still has nothing, it's not, it's not a re revocation of the law of Moses. He's not saying that that crime did not deserve the death penalty at all. He's pointing out their hypocrisies for trying to put this woman to death. They were there just trying to trick Jesus. They couldn't do it. And then verse 10, he's stuck, the, every, it's just a woman there now. Everyone else just left. They finally just, okay, you got us. They left, and the woman's still standing there. Verse 10, When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? Under the law of Moses, don't you need at the mouth of two or three witnesses in order to, to, to convict and have a death penalty sentence against somebody? Absolutely. Well, guess what? Her accusers are gone. So now it's just this woman and Jesus Christ. So if he is going to judge her, he can't even do it anyways because he doesn't have the two or three witnesses there. And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Jesus came to bring salvation. He didn't come to bring condemnation. That's not why he came. But guess what? When he sets up his millennial kingdom, there's not going to be adultery tolerated. If someone comes to him and says, Jesus, we have this woman taken in adultery, he's going to be upholding the law. Because he already came to be the Savior. He already came to fulfill that role. And that salvation is open to everybody. And when he comes back to fulfill that other, the, you know, the, the, another job, then that's what's going to happen. And, it, and it's not difficult to understand this stuff, but don't, you know, don't, be, don't be deceived by the people that want to take these verses and make them say something that they don't. It's why it's important. Just read the whole story. Get it in context. Like I said, verse 6 explains why they're even doing it to him because they're trying to attack Jesus Christ through his words. This isn't the first time. It's not the only time. They've done it multiple times throughout the Bible. You can see where they're trying to trick him. Oh, we've got, we've got a way we could trick him. They're laying snares for Jesus Christ and he answers it wisely every single time. Let's go back, if you would, to 2 Kings chapter 1. But I just wanted to point that out about him calling down fire from heaven because... There wasn't anything wrong with Elijah doing that. If there were, God wouldn't have given him the power to do that. He was right in doing it. But you don't take it because he was right in that situation doesn't mean it's right for you to just be like, hey God, I want to call down fire from heaven against anybody who I don't like. Against anyone who wrongs me. No, that's not the right spirit. That's not what Elijah was doing. It wasn't just anyone he didn't like. Right. There was a bunch of soldiers coming to take him and do who knows what because he had no idea. So let's pick back up in the story, verse number 13. Now we have the third captain. Now by the time the third, the third captain's a little bit smarter. He's already known that a hundred people just died. And he's probably thinking like, great. Like, why did you have to pick me to go get this guy? I don't, you know, this, these other two guys got wiped out. Verse 13, he sent again a captain of the third 50 with his 50. And the third captain of 50 went up. And, you know, nothing tells you you don't have power, that God is the one that truly has power, than just you could send your armies and God could just light them up. <laughs> Means nothing. You've got no power. You've got no power over the man of God unless God allows it to happen. And that's another point being proven here, by the way. 
And he sent again a captain of the third fifty with his fifty. And the third captain of fifty went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah. Notice he's not saying, come down quickly. The king's got to talk to you. He's got a different attitude. He's a little bit more humble. He gets on his knees and besought him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these fifty thy servants be precious in thy sight. And you know, this is just, this, I mean, this is really symbolic of the way that we need to approach God as a sinner when we're looking for mercy and salvation from God. Get on your knees, humble yourself, and just be like, God, you know, let my life be precious in your sight. When you, when you approach him with your proud attitude, it's not going to go over so well. In order to get saved, everyone needs to humble themselves in order to receive a free gift to think that you can't earn your own way into heaven and just say, God, I'm a sinner. I deserve hell. Lord, just please be merciful and save me. And notice with that attitude, what happens? Verse 14, behold, there came fire down from heaven and burnt up the two captains of the former fifties with their fifties. Therefore, let my life now be precious in thy sight. Verse 15, and the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, go down with him, be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down with him unto the king. So that approach worked. And the angel of, of, of the Lord tells Elijah, hey, you don't have to worry about this. It's fine. Go ahead and go with him. He had confirmation to, to, go, to go ahead. Verse 16, and he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, For as much as thou hast sent messengers to inquire of Baal-zebub, the god of Ekron, is it not because there is no god in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore thou shalt not come down off that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. All of that to do, to bring Elijah to him, for him to repeat the exact, like word for word, same message that was already delivered on him. Elijah's not a reed shaken in the wind. He was brought before the king. We talk about a moment where you might have temptation to, 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 to put things a little bit more mildly to beat around the bushes, to not say things as quite as directly or maybe to even change it all together and just say something that's going to make the king happy because he has the power to kill you. He has the power to cast you into prison. He has, you know, when you're saying something negative against the king, there's all kinds of reasons to back down. And Elijah did not, not even change one word. He said everything. You know why? Because he is not a respecter of persons. He didn't care that he was a king. He didn't care how much money he had. He doesn't care how much power he has because he knows he doesn't have any power except to come from God anyways. It doesn't matter. We need to get the same type of an attitude. It doesn't matter if you're talking to the president of the United States or if you're talking to the governor or you're talking to the police chief. or you're you know, Ultimately, it doesn't matter. You shouldn't change your story. You shouldn't change the word of God in order to suit whoever you're talking to. You need to just preach it the way that God said it. Word for word, the way God said it, because you're not going to be able to improve on that. And don't think that you know better than God. See, there's a lot of times I, I hear of, um, pre, I don't know this uh, personally firsthand from any particular um, preacher that I know, except just from what I've seen and witnessed and, and, and understand to be true and what I've heard about preachers having this attitude um, it's this approach in preaching the Bible and the Word of God where they'll not want to preach certain parts of the Bible because they don't want to offend some people or they don't want people to be turned away and they say, oh, but they're just a young Christian and if they hear this, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll preach it to them, but I'm just going to wait and wait and wait and then when I think that they're ready to be able to receive it, then I'll tell them the truth. Then I'll preach God's Word. That is a faulty way of thinking because now you're judging God's word and how people are going to receive it. Look, our job isn't to determine who's going to receive this and who isn't. The job of the preacher, the man of God, is supposed to just preach the word. Preach what needs to be preached. And look, if everybody's right on a certain topic, you know, you don't need to be preaching that every week. If everyone in church is saved, you don't need to be preaching a salvation message every week. Okay, we got that. Because you're worried about offending people over the rest of the word of God. 
No, what needs to be said and what needs to be preached is the things that are happening right then that, that people need to get right or that people need to be encouraged about or, the, you know, the, the various things that are in the Bible that we need. And not backing down and not saying, oh, well, I don't want anything bad. Now. I don't want them to leave. It's not for you to decide. It wasn't for Elijah to decide. He just said it. He has no idea how the king's going to respond. But he's going to say exactly what God told him to say, and he did. He has no problem saying things. And you know what? He, with the things that he said to other people, he had no problem saying right to the king's face. And you ought to be prepared to be the same way. If you're ever talking about somebody else, which I'm not saying, you know, it definitely shouldn't be gossiping anyways. But it's, there's nothing necessarily sinful about having a conversation about someone else, right? I mean, you could talk about people and to people and whatever, as long as you're not gossiping. But whatever you say about someone else, you ought to be able to say right to their face too. Right. And if you can't do that, then shut your mouth. Right. There'd be a lot less problems with the gossip and with the, you know, hearsay and with the divisions in churches and stuff if people could just take that advice. You either say something, you can say something to someone's face or don't say it at all. Elijah is able to say it right to the king's face. He was preaching the truth. I mean, that's what, when, you're, when you're preaching the truth, you don't have to worry about it. Well, let's finish up here the chapter, verse number 17. So he died according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah had spoken, and Jehoram reigned in his stead in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, because he had no son. Now the rest of the acts of Ahaziah, which he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? Now, this last couple of statements, this is, Ahaziah died, as, as was prophesied, and he didn't have any sons to replace him on the throne. So what happens is now they have another one of Ahab's children that takes his place on the throne, and his name is Jehoram. And I don't know why history had to happen like this, but it did. And this is the cause of a lot of confusion. This is, this is one of the difficult things when you're reading through Chronicles and Kings, especially when you, if you're going through and trying to get an exact timeline of everything, the Jehorams will cause you problems <laughs> because you have two kings with the same exact name, one the king of Israel and one the king of Judah, and they're reigning at the same time. <laughs> so pay attention to that when you're reading. You know, pay attention to who, which king it's talking about because one is the son of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was a godly king. Now his son was not because Jehoshaphat made affinity with Ahab, which means that he married into Ahab's family. So his son, Jehoram, he didn't grow up the way, in the ways of his father, Jehoshaphat. He grew up in the ways of, of his in-laws, of Ahab. And then you have Jehoram, which was already a son of Ahab. And it shows you, I think that shows you a little bit how tight-knit and too buddy-buddy Jehoshaphat was with Ahab because he named his son after one of Ahab's sons, it appears. I mean, they have the same name, Jehoram. So, but at, yeah, as you're doing your reading, just try to, you know, I'm just bringing this up because they are two separate kings. One's a king of Israel, one's a king of Judah. But try to follow along which one it's referring to when you're reading the Bible so you don't get them confused. But uh, let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. I thank you for these great stories and, and for us to be able to learn about the, the kings of Israel and Judah. Dear Lord, I pray that you please help us to learn the, the important truths that we need to learn. Help us to understand the, the Old Testament in light of the New Testament, dear God, help us to know the proper spirit that we need to have. I pray that you please help us to um, not be um, influenced by the world and the world's culture and the world's views of how men should be, and especially men of God, dear Lord, that we could just look to the Bible for our answers and for our um, role models and, and for the, the way that we ought to live our life. Pray that you please just open up our eyes, open up our ears, dear Lord. Help us not to be stiff-necked, to be very receptive to your words and the things of the Bible. And if we're whatever 
sins we're guilty of, dear Lord, I pray that you would please help bring those things to the, to the front of our minds. I pray that you would help me to, to preach on the things that people here need to hear and, and that you would open up to me the things that I need to hear, dear Lord, because I, I, I'm pretty sure everyone here has a heart that wants to serve you and just be right with you, dear Lord. Help us to uh, all to, to strive to, to get the sins out of our life and to do more to, to serve you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.